It's the Progress Pod, a production of the Franklin County Coalition for Progress. I'm Pete Mazzoni with Jeremy Kate. The United States is a nation of immigrants. It doesn't matter when you or your forebears arrived. The point is you came from somewhere else. Today, more than 40 million people living in the U.S. were born in another country, accounting for about one-fifth of the world's migrants in 2016. Our population of immigrants is also very diverse, with just about every country in the world represented among U.S. immigrants. The current political climate has made immigration a cultural and political flashpoint. Whether we're discussing a Muslim ban or the much-touted border wall, what has made us great is now being used as a tool of division. This simplistic bumper sticker rhetoric we've been hearing so much of recently highlights a deep need for greater examination and understanding of immigration in the U.S. Beginning Monday, October 8th, the Franklin County Coalition for Progress will be hosting a four-part series of talks on immigration. The series will feature a different speaker each Monday evening at the Coyle Free Library in Chambersburg. Our guest today is one of the featured speakers. Dr. Kathleen Kniff Pena will present on the push and pull factors that drive immigration from Latin America and how we as a country have both benefited and perpetuated this long cycle. She's with us today to talk more about that in the upcoming series. Thanks for coming on the show, Kathleen. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, we're excited to talk about this. You are bringing a historical perspective to this conversation, let's call it, rather than a debate. Yes, um, that's right. And go ahead and tell us kind of, the topic is push and pull factors. Go ahead and explain that to us, could you? Sure. So we will be talking about what are the factors that lead Latin American immigrants to want to leave their country? So what is pushing them out of their countries of origin? And then what are the pull factors that are pulling them to the United States? Why do they choose to come to the United States when mm-hmm. they choose that? Mm-hmm. And a little bit of ba- background about you. Um, you are not a native of Chambersburg, that's correct? That is correct. I grew up in the Philadelphia area in Delaware County. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And then you spent some time, uh, you were a Spanish teacher for a while? Yes, I started my career as a high school and junior high Spanish teacher. Um, I then moved into higher education, and now I'm a lecturer in Spanish at okay. Wilson College. And what attracted you to this subject? Well, a few things. Um, so I, I have a master's degree in Latin American studies where I focused in both history and literature. And in the area of history, my areas of concentration were U.S.-Latin American relations Mm -hmm. and the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. Mm -hmm. And when I was doing that coursework, I was studying at the University of New Mexico. So I was living in a border zone. And a few years prior, I had spent a semester in Chile um, living in the northernmost city of Chile on the border with Peru and Bolivia. Mm -hmm. So I had lived in two different border zones, and I really started to become interested in the way that both people and stories cross borders. Interesting. How do they approach these issues of migration and immigration? I mean, it's got to be a different dynamic. Talk about that a little bit. It is and it isn't. Um, I mean, so, so something that I'm going to talk about in this series is that Migration happens everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. It happens all over the globe, and it happens within Latin America, too. So we, here in the United States, we often think about Latin Americans just coming to the United States, and a lot of people don't realize that not all Latin Americans choose to come to the United States when they leave their countries of origin. Um, So, you know, in Chile right now, they have, I mean, they've always had movement of Bolivians and Peruvians into Chile to work. Um, usually it's the more affluent nation where you have the movement, right? right. So Chile is, is more affluent than Peru and Bolivia, and so you have a lot of workers coming in. Um, a lot of the same conflicts and resentments that you sometimes find when that happens, but also a lot of the same um, cultural accommodations. So you see a real blend of cultures. Mm-hmm. Um, and oftentimes those immigrants bring ideas and trends with them that will very gradually make their way into the rest of Chile. Sure. And so that's, I think, very similar to what happens here. Mm-hmm. Um, the same thing in other countries. I visited Costa Rica a few years ago. They had a lot of Nicaraguan workers and also Jamaican workers. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of Cubans migrate to have migrated um, historically to the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico. Mm-hmm. Right now we're seeing Venezuelans cross into Colombia and Ecuador. So there is a lot of movement within Latin America, not just from Latin America to the U.S. Sure, sure. 
So that push factor, that's the destabilization, or like Venezuela, you would say right now, yes. is a very destabilized place. Right. I would say their unstable political situation is what's pushing them mm -hmm. right now. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And also the economics of that situation. So I'll talk about political factors, economic factors, and environmental factors. Mm -hmm. Although sometimes it's a very complicated mix of the three. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. So let's get into the history Sure. that you have in your talk here. Um, I mean, you can pick a place to start. We can go back as far as you want or <laughs> wherever you like. But you start where you think, you know, it best represents the history kind of began. Right. So I start in 1823, which is when the United States issued the Monroe Doctrine, which mm -hmm. was a statement to Europe when Latin American countries started to declare independence from Spain and Portugal. The United States then issued this statement saying that um, the U.S. government would not allow any further colonization of Latin American countries by Europe. Now, that's kind of an empty threat from us, though, wasn't it? It was, yeah. I mean, in 1823, we had not yet fought a war on foreign soil. Mm -hmm. We really didn't have the might to back up that statement. Mm -hmm. um, and so Europe was just kind of like, oh, okay, you know, I'm not sure that they took it that seriously. Yeah. Latin America, on the other hand, heard that statement and, and took it with mixed feelings. On the one hand, um, they, you know, it was a nice show of solidarity from their northern neighbor. They had followed suit with our own independence movement, right? And mm -hmm. then they then proceeded to declare independence from their, from their European powers as well. Um, on the other hand, we said no further colonization by Europe, not no further right. colonization. And so there was some suspicion, too, that maybe the United States was thinking of taking Europe's place. Now, were, was there uh, labor moving back and forth uh, from Latin America to the United States before the Monroe Doctrine? N not really, no. Mm -hmm. No, we're talking about... Um, well, I mean, there was always some movement between the colonies, right? Sure. So if we look at just the history of North America, um, we often say when we study U.S. history, okay, well, Jamestown was the first European colony mm -hmm. established in the United States. That's not exactly true, right? Jamestown um, was the first English settlement in the 13 colonies. But if we look at what is today the United States, um, the Spanish had, had moved into New Mexico by the 1540s. They established mm -hmm. the city of St. Augustine, Florida in 1565. We have Spanish place names all over the United States. Oh, boy, do we. <laughs> um, a lot that we don't realize, and sometimes i that's something I do with my Spanish classes um, at Wilson, right, is, is talk about all of these different place names that come from Spanish, and they're like, what? You know, they don't realize all of yeah. them. Las Vegas, Santa Fe, San Francisco, San Antonio, all the sands, of course. Right. Um, but then also state names, Colorado, Florida, Nevada, um, Cape Canaveral even comes from Cañaveral, which is sugarcane field. I did not know that. Right. So we have a lot of um, Spanish and Hispanic history but in you, the United States. Do you think that kind of speaks to how the history we're taught is Eurocentric? Well, I think when we study our colonial history, we tend to, and when we teach our colonial history, we tend to teach English colonial history. Yes. And there is some fairness to that, right? I mean, it was those those 13 English colonies that first declared themselves the United States, mm -hmm. but then they incorporated the former Spanish colonies. Mm -hmm. So there is sometimes, I hear a sense from people in the in these immigration debates that we have that you know that this is so new and that this is so contrary to quote unquote our culture but our culture and history have long been connected mm -hmm. to spanish and hispanic culture mm -hmm. okay so i got us off track there let's get back to <laughs> sure. uh 1823 monroe doctrine uh -huh. and so continue on with the effects that had on migration and Sure, absolutely. So the United States um, in 1823 really kind of threw its hat down in Latin America. And one of the images that I'm going to share in my presentation is a political cartoon which shows Uncle Sam literally throwing his hat on the map okay. on Latin America and, and the European nations just looking on. And that was actually, um, so that, that cartoon I'm going to share is actually from 100, almost 100 years later, when by then the United States really had entered into Latin America. Mm -hmm. And so it's something that we don't realize when we talk about Latin Americans coming here to the U.S., that we really went there first. Mm -hmm. And so we have from 1846 to 1848, the Mexican-American War, 
where the United States would, U.S. troops would make it all the way down to Mexico City, Mm -hmm. um, would debate at one point taking the entire country. Now, let me let me stop you there. So, talk a little bit more about the Mexican uh, Mexican American War or Mexican War, however you choose. Mm -hmm. That was basically to claim Texas, was it not? Texas had declared itself independent from Mexico by that point. Oh, okay. Um, so by this point, Mexico had already, in, in 1810, was Mexico's first call for independence from Spain. Mm-hmm. Um, and so by this point, by 1846, um, Texas had already decided it didn't want to be a part of the new nation of Mexico. So Texas had declared itself independent. Um, but then U.S. troops had a territory dispute over the Nueces River. Um, and they ended up using that territorial dispute as an excuse to enter into the war. And they charged down into Mexico proper, correct? Yes, yes, they did. Mm-hmm. They charged down into Mexico proper and made it all the way to Mexico City. Mm-hmm. Um, the ultimate effect was that we took as much Mexican territory that we could that had the fewest Mexicans in it. Really? Um, so those those far north reaches of Mexico, which at the time were New Mexico, Arizona, California, were the territories that we ended up claiming. Mm-hmm. That ended up being a very pro- a very lucrative decision for the United States mm-hmm. as well, because just one year, um, you know, 1948 was when we we concluded that agreement to take those territories in 1849, we know that we struck gold in California. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that would really create that economic might that Mm -hmm. the United States had lacked prior, not just from gold from California, but wool from sheep farmers in New Mexico, Mm -hmm. copper mines in Arizona. Um, And so really a part of, I would say Latin America is a real part of the story of U.S. prosperity. And then to extract all these natural resources, that took... Mexican labor. There you go. <laughs> right. So you could put a, a date around that and say this is kind of when this, this began. Yes. And they came in and they you know, had to do that labor. Mm-hmm. Let me go back to the Monroe Doctrine and just ask a question. What were, what were the driving forces with the government saying, that's it, no more involvement in Latin America? Was there business interests that were looking south and saying, hey, there's opportunity down here, we got to we got to clean mm-hmm. it out and get the Europeans out. Well, go ahead. Great question. We learn in school about the concept of manifest destiny, right? And yes. I think we often associate that with westward expansion. Mm-hmm. But really, manifest destiny was the belief that the United States had a God-given right to expand right. in any direction, right? And so uh, I think that from the earliest years of U.S. government, um, government leaders and policymakers looked towards Latin America as a natural extension of our territory. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we always saw economic possibilities there, not to mention that we were thinking about strategic military points. So the next great interest was in Cuba, which is only 90 miles from Florida Mm -hmm. um, and has always been a strategic military point because of that and because of its strategic location right near the mouth of the Mississippi River, which is a critical entry point in the United States. So as early as Thomas Jefferson on, every U.S. president would express an interest in Cuba Mm -hmm. and would often talk about Cuba as if it were just inevitable that it would eventually be incorporated into the United States. Oh, that's an interesting way to look at the world, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> this will just be ours eventually. <laughs> right. And we were okay with Spain having control of Cuba because that was one of the few countries that didn't declare independence mm-hmm. between 1810 and 1830. Mm-hmm. Um, and U.S. policy makers used the uh, the no transfer policy, basically, was, was how they thought about Cuba. So we were okay with Spain having control of Cuba because Spain was not a threat to us. It was a declining power, right? It had already lost a lot of its colonies, but we weren't okay with Cuba going to anyone else right? because we didn't want one of our enemies. You know, if Cuba declared independence, there was this thought that one of our enemies might then go in and uh, and take control of irony Cuba. of all ironies that one of our greatest adversaries eventually did yes yes <laughs> hence the uh, the Cuban so Missile Crisis right all right mm-hmm. well, let's get back on track here um, the gold rush is where we left off mm-hmm. so right so I what I'm going to talk about is how through the Mexican American War the Spanish American War which was actually the war that we fought to take Cuba. Puerto Rico, Guam, the Philippines, um, and then also the 
U.S.-backed independence movement of Panama, um, which would then lead to us constructing the Panama Canal and would mm -hmm. pave the way for U.S. businesses to move into Central America and the Caribbean. Um, all of this would lead to a series of U.S. military occupations and a great deal of U.S. economic influence throughout Latin America throughout the 20th century. Now, going to the Panama Canal, mm -hmm. uh, was that just a, an agreement that we're going to come down and do this, or was that we Not had to use quite. force? Or <laughs> Get into that a little sure. bit. Sure. So at the time, Panama was part of Colombia. Mm -hmm. And so when Colombia declared independence from Spain, Panama was part of that territory. Mm -hmm. The United States was very interested, because of our economic interests, right, and our expanding sphere of influence there towards the south, the United States was very interested in building a canal so that we could easily transport goods. And Colombia didn't want to give up that territory. They did sure. not want the United States to build that canal. And so the United States instead backed an independence movement. Um, some people, you know, historians sometimes say that Teddy Roosevelt decided to create his own country. Uh -huh. um, and that's pretty much what we did is that we sent occupying forces, we backed an independence movement so that Panama could separate, it, separate from Colombia, and then we had them sign the agreement right. for the Panama Canal. And I think this is key because this is where, as far as I read your, your talk, this is where we begin to destabilize yes. these countries. Sometimes people use the term banana republic um, to describe this historical period. And, you know, it's funny because I say this to students sometimes and they think that Banana Republic is just a store. <laughs> uh, but Banana Republic was, is actually a pretty offensive term when you think of it in sure. these senses. Um, and so it refers to a moment in our history where um, large U.S. corporations would hold enormous power in small Caribbean and Central American nations. Mm -hmm. um, it could have been a sugar company or a fruit company or an oil corporation, right? Mm -hmm. There were lots of different types of economic activity. But the, the, we say Banana Republic because the fruit companies were so iconically powerful in this time. And so let's say that um, a United States fruit corporation has major operations in a small Central American nation. Um, the workers on that plantation decide to go on strike or demand better wages or better working conditions. The fruit corporations then go to the United States and ask them to intervene, or sometimes they might go to the government of that country and ask them to intervene. That strike is then crushed. If then social upheaval starts to occur, then the United States would send an occupying force um, under the justification of protecting the country from the forces of anarchy yeah. um, or maybe protecting U.S. interests and U.S. citizens in that country. We would maybe train a police force or a military force who would then oftentimes lead to the next military regime. So that happened in Nicaragua. Um, we invaded in the early... 20th century, and we helped to train a National Guard mm -hmm. so that the National Guard would keep stability once U.S. forces left. Mm -hmm. So the head of that National Guard... But was, isn't that what they're really asking for is protect U.S. interests? Exactly, right. They don't um, care about the people. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily, right? So, so yeah, so the Samosa would, would rise to the head of the National Guard. Samosa and his two sons would then be dictators of Nicaragua until 1979 when they were overthrown by a revolution. That revolution then led to waves of refugees coming to the United States. You could follow the same or similar patterns in Cuba, um, in the Dominican Republic, where you have um, U.S. trained police or National Guard or military forces, mm -hmm. a U.S. backed dictator, and then eventually um, large scale revolution as a so result. So we backed of that. a lot of bad people we in did. Latin America for, we the, did. for the sake of stability. Yes, um, for the sake of stability. And then later during the Cold War, and I know I'm jumping around historically okay. here, um, but later during the Cold War, we would back a lot of dictators under, under the guise of protecting the hemisphere from communism. Right, right. And so, um, you know, that was really our singular focus during the Cold War. And so any leader who pledged to keep communism out of the hemisphere 
we would back. Did we back if, Batista in Cuba? Yes, we did. Um, now, we're talking pre-Cold War here. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, Batista was backed by the United States, and he was the dictator who would then be overthrown by Fidel Castro. Mm-hmm. Which they should have seen coming. I mean, because sure. he, he was a bad guy, and yeah. uh, you know, revolution came. And I think that's kind of what happens a lot of the time, isn't it? That, you know, the people reach a breaking point. Sure, absolutely. I mean, Fidel Castro didn't come out of nowhere. The United States had first intervened in Cuba in in 1898 Mm -hmm. and intervened many times between 1898 and 1959. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So communism was largely kept out of Latin America, though. Except for small instances. Right. So Cuba would be an exception to that, although Mm -hmm. that so so that's a long history. I mean, I I used to teach a course just on U.S. Cuban relations and we could talk forever about the Cuban Revolution and its origins. Um, But yeah, so Fidel Castro would eventually declare his government to be communist. Um, Some people feel that that was his intention all along, and others think that he was backed into a corner and he had no choice but to ally with the Soviet Union Mm -hmm. um, when he was cut off by the United States and all of our allies. Well, he's facing one of the biggest superpowers in the world. Mm -hmm. The only other thing you can do is play the other one off of of. Sure, sure. And that's still, um, you know, even in recent years, of course, Fidel Castro has passed now, but even, you know, as as a very old leader, Fidel Castro would use the David and Goliath yeah. Um, comparison to talk about how you know Cuba was up against a giant, and yeah. and that was how he would justify what you know what became his own dictatorship, right? Mm-hmm. Well, you need me, you know, the Cuban right. people need me because if I'm not here and if we don't have this revolutionary government, if we're not on the lookout, that big bad giant to the north is going to come and invade us again. So right. it it was a fear tactic as well that he would later use in his own sure. regime. So getting back to uh, migration and labor in Central America. Let's get into the U.S. companies, the sugar companies, the fruit companies. Mm -hmm. Uh, Talk a little bit about the history of uh, their involvement. Sure. So this was partly as a result of the Civil War in the United States. So Mm -hmm. we, you know, when we look at the U.S.-Mexican War and then the the Spanish-American War, there's this gap in between, right, which is when the United States was involved in its own civil war. And as a result of that and the I, I hate to interrupt mm-hmm. but the civil war was also about labor yes it was <laughs> yeah and and that's why it also connects to our relationships with latin america because mm-hmm. when slavery was abolished in the united states um many southern plantation landowners would then seek better or more favorable labor right. conditions in the Caribbean and Central America. That's not to say that there was slavery there because slavery had been outlawed mm-hmm. um, in Latin America by this point as well, but they could find situations that were more favorable to them in terms of being force. able to exploit a labor force, yeah. right? Um, and so there was a large influx of U.S. landowners in Cuba and in Central America. Um, and then two fruit companies would merge into the United Fruit Company, and that was really the most famous fruit company to be involved in Latin America, mm-hmm. um, which would then you know, establish fruit growing operations throughout Central America and the Caribbean. Mm-hmm. Uh, another interesting topic you bring up is the Bracero program. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about that. Sure, so that happened um, during World, World War II when the United States started to send troops overseas. And we needed labor in our factories and in our fields. Mm -hmm. And so we initiated a program called the Bracero Program, and that comes from the word for brazo or arm, right? We needed strong arms, strong Mm -hmm. labor for our fields and factories. And so the Bracero Program was a guest worker visa program that brought guest workers from Mexico into the United States. Um, yes, it was. It was an. It, okay. I believe it was just an agreement with Mexico. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so that was uh, between the two governments. They made an agreement. Yes. Yes. And then what? What kind of labor force came north? Was it you know thousands and thousands of people or? Well, the program was in effect from the 1940s until 1962, if I'm remembering correctly. I remember one number that was somewhere around 5 million workers that came and wow. went during that time. Um, That's a lot of people. It is a lot of people. And, and a, lot of, you know, a lot of them didn't stay at that point. They were coming and going. Mm-hmm. And this is another thing we'll talk about is that 
you know, all of a sudden in the 1970s, we start to use this term illegal immigration. Um, before that, it really wasn't a part of our vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we start to perceive a crisis in our immigration system. And a lot of people wonder where this comes from. In 1965, we changed our, our immigration laws. And what were they before 1965? There were no country limits. Okay. And also in 1962, just a few years prior, we had ended the Bracero program. Now, at the end of that program, all these workers were to return to Mexico? Right. At least we thought that, you know, after decades of labor and family relationships of people coming and going from Mexico and, and working in the United States, that, that those streams of labor would stop just because we said so. Um, <laughs> and that's not really the case, not right. only because those laborers relied on, on the work that they were finding in the United States, but also because the farms and factories in the United States really relied on their labor yeah, as well. Right. Um, there were family relationships, right? Sometimes people would come and they would marry um, you know, with US citizens. They would, they would develop relationships with people. This is what human beings do. And so you really just can't stop right. um, a migration pattern just by changing the law. And there was also nothing to replace it. That's what I was going to ask. If they were to return to Mexico, what was the state of the economy there versus ours? Uh, not great, right? right? I mean, they wouldn't, if they found work, they wouldn't find it at the same pay, right? right. They wouldn't be able to support their families at the same level. Mm -hmm. And so we had two things happening, right? So there was the end of the Bracero program. There's nothing to replace it. In 1965, we start to put country limits um, and our immigration process starts to become the complicated process that we know it to be today. Now, was that a reaction to these immigrants being here? What, what, what drove that? The funny thing is, um, in my talk, I'm going to mention this article by Douglas Massey and Karen Pren, um, two researchers from Princeton University, and their, their article is called Unintended Consequences of U.S. Immigration Policy, Explaining the Post-1965 Surge from Latin America. And what they look at is the fact that this, uh, they say unintended consequences because the change in immigration laws in 1965 was not because we had an immigration problem. It was actually um, to make our immigration laws more equal. It was a, it was a result of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. So prior to that, we did have some caps on certain regions of the world, like Asia and Africa. And so in taking away the regional caps, we then just said, okay, let's put country caps instead. But we had never had caps for Latin America. What was the reasoning behind caps on Asia or Africa? Well, in previous years, the United States um, had limited immigration from those countries. It was um, more than anything, I would say, racist ideology mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that didn't believe that okay. immigrants from those regions of the world belonged in the United States. Right, right. So these five million people are here. The program ends. Uh, obviously, a lot of people stayed. Yes. And now, because it was now more difficult for them to come and go, a lot of people then stayed permanently. Mm -hmm. um, and then combine that with the fact that this is also the Cold War era, right? So this is also the time when those Central American and Caribbean countries that had lived through decades of dictatorship are starting to rise up against those dictatorships. Mm -hmm. Um, in some of those countries, like in Nicaragua and Cuba, the United States is pushing back with um, counter-revolutionary forces. There is economic instability, there's violence, and so at the same time that we ended one guest worker program, put limits on countries, um, we also have political and economic crises that are driving waves of refugees from Central America and the Caribbean into the United States. And how the United States government would react to each one of those groups would depend very much on our relationship with that particular government. Mm -hmm. So, for example, when people came from Cuba, we accepted them generally because we were against the government of Fidel Castro, right? Right. It was a victory lap. It was a victory lap because we were trying to say to our own citizens and to the world, look how bad communism is. Yeah. See all these people that don't want to live there and they're coming here and we're going to accept them with open arms into our democratic capitalist society, right? And so we would eventually declare a policy for Cuba called the wet foot, dry foot policy, which stated that 
as long as a Cuban refugee made it to U.S. shores, there was a path to citizenship mm -hmm. for that refugee. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, if a refugee came, say, from Guatemala or El Salvador, those were countries where we were supporting anti-communist right. dictatorships. Mm -hmm. And so this happened, that people came from El Salvador and Guatemala, they asked for refugee status, but in order to grant that refugee status, the United States government would have to acknowledge that their governments in their countries of origin were persecuting their own people. We and couldn't, couldn't admit that. We couldn't do that because we were giving military support to those regimes. And so in some cases, we deported people back to their countries of origin basically to be placed in front of a firing squad. And this is when we really see the first groups of Central American migrants who chose to be undocumented during this time. What years are we talking about? We're talking about the 1970s okay. and 80s primarily, right. mm -hmm. okay. when we had um, civil wars in El Salvador, um, genocide in Guatemala, um, you had right-wing death squads eliminating entire villages of indigenous mm -hmm. peoples. Mm -hmm. um, in Nicaragua, there was at the time the Sandinista Revolution, which took power in 1979, and then the 80s, the, the entire decade of the 80s would be the counter-revolutionary forces. And the Sandinistas were uh, communists? Um, we, we interpreted them as communists. They were leftists, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, the United States had a very black and white vision of the, of the world during the Cold War, right? Um, you were either capitalist or you were an agent of Soviet expansion, right? Yeah. And so whether or not the Soviets were involved in leftist movements in Latin America, we interpreted every leftist movement in Latin America as Soviet influence. Right. So you mentioned that this was the first time undocumented immigrants uh, started coming here or staying here. Talk mm -hmm. about that a little bit. Sure. So let's say that I come from a country like Guatemala or El Salvador in the 1980s, and I know that, um, because obviously people talk to each other, right? I know that mm -hmm. others have already been deported when they've tried to get refugee status or mm -hmm. they've tried to get asylum in the United States. And so it obviously I don't want to be sent back to my country to right. be put in front of a firing squad, so I'm just going to hide in the shadows, essentially, um, rather than face death in my own country. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there was work here. There was work here. So we are coming out of the 80s. Um, what's going on? Where are we? Um, I would say in the 80s and 90s now, we start to hear more and more of this political narrative of uh, Latin American immigrants invading the United States, right, or changing our culture, which is funny because that's the same narrative that was happening in Latin America about American invasions, you know, a hundred years back. If you look at Mexican newspapers, for example, from really from any time between 1848 and 1910, you're going to see a lot of concern about um, you know, the Americans who are coming and, and I say Americans as in people from the U.S., um, coming and, you know, changing our culture and our language and exploiting our workers. Um, Mexican laborers, for example, weren't always, even in Mexico, weren't paid as well by U.S. companies as U.S. workers in Mexico, right? And so there was a lot of resentment. So now, now we have the opposite movement. Um, and one of the, I, I include some sources or some suggestions for further reading for my audience, and one of them is a book called Harvest of Empire by Juan Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. And Harvest of Empire is the way that he describes immigration in the United States, right? We, we sowed the seeds um, in U.S. imperialism throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, and, and now what we have is the harvest. We mm -hmm. have the effects or the consequences of our own actions in mm -hmm. Latin America. Mm -hmm. Where do you think that, let's call it resentment or fear, came from? I honestly believe that it was first created as a political narrative. Um, this is also the thesis of Douglas Massey and Karen Prenn from that study that I cited earlier. They look at, you know, when the term illegal immigration first started to come about in our, in our media. Mm -hmm in the US and they say it's interesting because at that time you were talking like 1965 1970 the United States didn't have an immigration problem we actually had the lowest number 
of foreign-born citizens ever. So <laughs> mm -hmm. there wasn't an immigration problem, but U.S. politicians start to realize around this time that it's a convenient narrative for them. Now, would this have been border state politicians or? I think it started in the border states, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Sure. Sure. Even though they're benefiting from the labor very directly. I mean, it, if you think about California, giant agriculture, mm -hmm. but it does work. Sure, absolutely. And that's one of the things um, that Char Wise is going to talk to us about in our series on the economics of immigration. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we, there's a lot of misinformation out there about whether or not immigrants benefit or hurt our economy. Um, Char Wise is a professor of economics at Gettysburg, and, and he'll be talking to us about that topic. Well, the bottom line is that they do benefit the economy. Right. <laughs> um, here in our little town of Chambersburg, you don't have to look far. Right. And you can see who's out there working in the fields. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's just reality. Sure. So what are some common myths or misconceptions about immigrants um, that need to be addressed? I would say one thing I hear often um, just talking to people or watching these arguments sometimes happen on social media mm -hmm. um, in our news media I see this argument that um, there's us and them right so these people don't share our values and they don't speak our language and they're different and they're going to fundamentally change what is American right and there's this um, defensive nationalism I would say first of all you might be surprised at how many of our values Latin American immigrants share. Um, for example, my husband is a Latin American immigrant. We met in Chile um, when I was studying there at one point, and, and he came here three years ago. He grew up in a household where his father was working for General Motors in mm -hmm. Chile. You know, he, he loves American cars. He grew up watching The Simpsons. Although they speak Spanish in Chile, of course. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, so, you know, you might think that, that Latin Americans don't share our values, but, you know, your Latin American neighbor might have grown up watching American TV, driving American cars, um, working for an American company, which mm -hmm. promotes American work culture. If, they're, if they were at one point military or police in their countries of origin, they may have been trained by U.S. forces. We do still train um, soldiers from Latin America and police forces. So there are a lot of shared values and a lot of shared culture there. Well, in, it's a disingenuous narrative at its core. And it, it really, I think it speaks to people who have an innate fear of the other. Mm -hmm. And it kind of, you know, emboldens them to embrace that fear further. Mm -hmm. Because what you're, what you're talking about is people are people. If you travel and you, you get out there in the world, you see there's more in common than there's different. Right. And, and that's the thing that this narrative tries to push to the side. Mm -hmm. Say, that's not true. These people are different. Right. And different is bad. And, they, and the other narratives, they don't want to learn English. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I constantly work with, um, not just here in Chambersburg, but in Berks County, where I came from, in Philadelphia, where I was working on my doctorate, and, and prior to that in New Mexico. I would say in every place where I've lived and interacted with Latino communities, immigrant communities, um, the one thing I hear the most when I say, you know, what's hard for you is that the immigrants I meet are desperate to learn English. Sure. Um, I mean, when, when my husband first moved to the United States, we were living in Reading, Pennsylvania. Um, it took about six months to get him into an English class. There, was, there were waiting lists. Mm -hmm. And that's the case almost everywhere. So I find, and I've, I've found that a lot of times here in Chambersburg when I talk to people and say, what does, you know, what does the community need? Mm -hmm. um, we need citizenship classes we need um, which is something I'm actually working on doing this spring mm -hmm. um, some citizen citizenship classes in Spanish so teaching US civics and history in Spanish so that they can kind of process the information and then eventually right produce it in English as they have to for the citizenship test sure. um, and also English classes and so that's another thing I've been working on here in Chambersburg um, of course we have the Literacy Council which offers English classes um, but I've also been thinking about maybe doing some conversation exchanges with my Spanish students at Wilson and, mm -hmm. and members of the community who really are very eager to speak English and, and improve their English. And that is probably one of the biggest myths mm -hmm. out there that, you know, learn to speak English. And the other thing I think a lot of people have to understand is 
English is a very hard language to learn. Yes, it takes time. In fact, the, the statistic is that it takes an average of seven years oh, wow. for someone who is educated, right, who has at least a high school education, mm -hmm. to feel really comfortable speaking mm -hmm. another language. Yeah. Well, listen, it's been a great conversation. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Um, we want to make sure everybody gets out to the talks. Jeremy, go ahead and give us the details, if you would. Yeah, the series begins on October 8th. Uh, it's from 6 to 7. That's a Monday night, and it'll go for four weeks on Monday evenings from 6 to 7 at the Coil Free Library. And the first speaker is uh, John Leadcock. It'll be Immigration 101, so that's uh, Monday, October 8th. And then followed up by you, Kathy, yes. uh, on... Um, October 15th, and then Economics of Immigration, which you spoke about with mm -hmm. Char Weiss on uh, October 22nd, and Advocacy and Next Steps with Elizabeth Alex on Monday, October 29th. And you can find out more information on this at the uh, Franklin County Coalition for Progress website. That's FCCforprogress.org. And uh, we look forward to the discussion. Thanks. So, I yeah. look forward to it, too. Yeah. And I would also suggest to anyone out there listening, if you know someone who is kind of on the wrong side of this debate, encourage them to come and get up to speed on what's really happening. I think that the more we know, you know, the better off we all are. Yeah, and each speaker, they will follow, up, follow the speaker with a question and answer session, so everybody will have a, an opportunity to participate. So again, thanks a lot, and uh, find us online at progresspod.org, and we are on Twitter at The Progress Pod. Thanks for listening.